I give the word to my colleague Magda, who is going to set the scene for us on reuse and repair. Magda, the word. Thank you, Astrid. Um, so, as Astrid mentioned, um, we have recently published a policy brief on uh, the topic of reuse and repair, um, as, as is the topic of our workshop today as well. And I will just share a couple of key um, messages uh, from this policy brief. Um, so what you can find in the policy brief uh, are guest contributions from reuse um, and waste serve Malta. Uh, you can also find uh, European policy context, uh, such as the waste framework directive, the circular economy action plan, uh, the topic of uh, right to repair. Um, you can see information about the EU financial support, and you can find a lot of good practices and uh, policy solutions and also recommendations. Uh, when it comes to the European framework for the topic of reuse and repair, uh, we have a number of um, targets and we have a number of topics related to this that are mentioned in respective directives. In the revised waste framework directive, um, the European Commission encourages uh, the member states to promote reuse and repair uh, through both educational and economic incentives, um, such as, for example, creating uh, accredited repair and reuse centers. Um, and there are also uh, targets for preparation for use and recycling of municipal waste, uh, which will be increased, and it is uh, to 55%, 60%, and 65% by weight, uh, respectively to the years 2025, 2030, and 2035. Um, so quite a lot going on in this direction. Um, we have something called right to repair. Uh, that's a concept that's discussed a lot uh, on the EU level. It has been announced in several EU documents, including the Green Deal, including the Circular Economy Action Plan. And um, it can refer to a number of things. Uh, one of these things is um, well-known uh, two-year um, uh, well, two-year right uh, that we have as consumers in the EU to uh, have our products repaired or, um, uh, or uh, well, uh, or we can be given a new product uh, within this period. Uh, but when it comes uh, to uh, a longer time frame, uh, there are no obligations for the producers. Um, so uh, it is something that uh, that is still discussed. If, for example, producers and manufacturers should be, um, um, uh, sh if they sh should uh, provide manuals for repairs, so that uh, we can repair our products ourselves. And uh, something that's also very much discussed uh, in connection to right to repair is product obsolescence. Um, and now the discussions are around whether this should be considered an unfair commercial practice and therefore uh, then, well, banned and uh, uh, seen as illegal under the EU law. Uh, there are some uh, new reuse targets for packaging uh, in the revised packaging and packaging waste directive, uh, which we'll hear more about at the end of the workshop. And uh, there are also uh, uh, there is also a proposal for a new eco design for sustainable products regulation in the eco design directive, um, which establishes a framework to set uh, requirements to improve product durability, reusability, and repairability. Um, and uh, well, lastly um, and most importantly, we have a lot of policy solutions uh, from different inter-Europe projects uh, on reuse and repair centers, on deposit return systems, reusable packaging, and reuse and social employment. So definitely have a look at the policy brief and um, get inspired. Thank you very much. And now, uh, 
without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, our first keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Fred Dorsemann from Behaven, who will talk about the importance of uh, behavior change and how it can drive the adoption of reuse and revert practices. Uh, Fred, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my slides. If you can confirm, it's uh, all working fine. Yes, it all yeah. looks good. Thank you very Perfect. much. Perfect. Brilliant. Um, welcome, uh, everyone, and uh, thanks for um, having me this afternoon. Uh, I'm actually quite excited to talk about uh, reuse and repair. Uh, we, we, we talk of often about the, the effort that it takes to, um, to reuse and, and repair, both as an organization, putting systems in place, or as, as a citizen adopting these practices. And actually, these are also the sort of initiatives that can be very uh, rewarding, you know, like, for instance, being able to wear an old pair of shoes for uh, longer. I, for instance, I recently went to buy a second pair of these uh, boots uh, at uh, Decathlon, who launched a, uh, in, in their stores. Uh, they are now uh, proposing secondhand products. And I felt really smart actually buying, uh, you know, one of uh, one of these pair of shoes uh, with like perhaps higher quality for the same price. So there is a lot of um, uh, positive uh, aspects to uh, reuse and repair uh, practices and, be and behaviors. I'm also, I mean, just like you, very curious to hear about the different initiatives that are going to be shared in the course of the afternoon. Uh, and I'd like to, as a start, say a few words, not so much about the, the technical or uh, econo uh, uh, economic or uh, legislative aspect, but, but more about the human uh, behavior side of things. Um, in a nutshell, that's what we do at Behaven. We use behavior science to help uh, people like yourself develop uh, programs uh, that uh, encourage uh, sustainable uh, circular behavior. And so um, where it starts is that we, so the starting point is, is this one, a sustainable world is not possible without uh, behavior change. So of course, we need to put in place technical solutions, whether they come from businesses or, or from uh, governments, but very often uh, making these solutions available and informing people about them is part of the, uh, the, the work that we need to do. But very often, it's not, uh, it's not sufficient in itself. And we also need to proactively take people by the hand and get them to adopt uh, and maintain uh, using uh, these, uh, these technical uh, solutions. And uh, interestingly, as, as I was preparing for this talk, I was reviewing a few uh, papers that were published recently. And I thought that quote that you, that you can see on the right is actually quite a good, uh, a good summation of what I've just said. It says, while the techno economic side of the circular economy has attracted large attention in, recent, uh, attention in recent years, the role of consumer behavior, a critical factor in defining the long-term success of sustainable production and consumption initiatives remain less uh, explored. And so, um, and, and yet it's very relevant for uh, circular uh, systems and uh, initiatives. I mean, for instance, uh, let, let's take the different phases of a, a product uh, life cycle. Uh, I've, I've summarized it with you know, these three main steps on, on, on the page, purchase, use, end of life. You can see that, for, for instance, for each of these three steps, we can identify a number of uh, circular behavior that we would like and we would even need people to adopt if we want our programs to be successful. For instance, uh, at the purchase stage, we would want people to consider engaging with more circular uh, business models. In the course of using the product, we would want people to make sure that they maintain the product that they have, that they take good care of these products. And then at the end of life, we would want to make sure that people properly dispose of these products, uh, for instance, returning instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, stockpiling. So as you can see at each of these steps, we have behavioral elements to consider, not just you know, technical or uh, financial ones. Um, which is not that, that, that easy to, uh, to do, uh, both for citizens and for ourselves. As a really uh, simple example, I've been using a, a, a refillable bottle for quite a few years now, and I'm still surprised at, um, um, at the number of times 
that I would forget to take it with me uh, going to uh, um, uh, uh, meetings uh, at clients, for instance, and therefore having to, uh, on, on my way to having to buy a plastic bottle because I didn't think about uh, taking my re uh, refillable bottle. So it's one thing, of course, to put the right systems in place, but we also need to make sure that we understand how uh, people function. Perhaps a key point to say uh, is that conventional approaches are often insufficient to respond to such uh, challenges. Um, uh, that's just because actually a lot of these uh, behaviors that we want to, uh, people to adopt are at the end of the day under the control of individuals. We, we don't necessarily have a, a direct way to, to, uh, to provide a practical technical solutions. And uh, there is a number of research uh, studies and reports that show that information uh, incentive legislation have a role to play, but don't necessarily have the power to do all of the work from moving people from where they are now to the desired um, uh, behavior. Well, that's because they tend to focus in general on what you would call extrinsic elements, elements that are external to uh, the person, like infrastructure, for instance. But as I said, we also need to consider human attributes like acceptance or habits, for instance. I mean, just to take a really simple example, uh, if, if we look at providing information, let's assume, uh, that, let's assume that the, we've, we've done a great job at informing people about a new initiative and people are, have even uh, translated that information into intentions of using your initiative. Uh, there is still a big gap at times between people having the right intentions and people putting, uh, translating these intentions into behavior. Uh, interestingly, look at these, uh, some of these uh, examples and uh, numbers on the left. It shows for uh, purchase, use, and end of life, a number of uh, stats uh, that shows the difference between intention and behavior. So in light blue, it's the intention. In dark blue, it's the behavior. And we can see that there is very often a huge gap between uh, a high level of intention so people are, you know, they have the, their heart in the right place to say it like that, but it doesn't translate into uh, into uh, into action. And so, if we want to do a good job or a better job at uh, influencing uh, circular behavior, we need a more complete picture. We need to take into account the different types of uh, influences that will uh, result in people doing or uh, doing the, the behavior uh, uh, or uh, struggling to do that behavior. And the reason why it's important to consider that uh, more complete picture is because uh, the gaps that we just talked about uh, on the slide before are the results of different types of uh, factors, external ones and internal ones. And so therefore we want to make sure we, we give ourselves a full picture. And so one way to look at it is to think about three types of factors of influences that will result in people doing the things you want them to do. We need to think about contextual factors, like for instance, uh, putting in place the right infrastructure, but then we, we, we want to make sure that we, what we ask people uh, is not taking too much of their time. Uh, for instance, if I have to travel very far to get something recycled, that might be a bit a bit hard to do. Um, there is also the social context uh, to consider. I share some some examples in the next slides, and then we of course need to make sure we understand the different uh, internal forces that people uh, can be under the influence of, and that can of course, uh, as I said, facilitate or, or hinder the behavior. Um, here are some uh, some examples of these uh, of these elements applied to a uh, circular behavior. So it could well be that the barriers that we have to overcome are, uh, and, and let's focus on the, the individual ones. It could well be, for instance, that there is a lack of knowledge about the environmental benefits of buying secondhand product, if that's what you uh, that's what you propose. Uh, an interesting one also is uh, the behavioral cost. So we, we often talk about fi the financial incentives and the financial cost of doing or not doing something. But very often there is also a behavioral cost, like a mental effort or a physical effort that people have to do that might you know, uh, prevent them uh, from doing what you want them to do. So for instance, a perceived convenience or the effort to do a behavior. Um, interestingly, another example, uh, many others, 
is that uh, people sometimes associate uh, waste with what is thrown away, uh, not from not what they buy, which also you know skews their uh, perception. And talking about perception, another another example is the the perception that if an item has had a good life, I've used it for a long time, uh, uh, I've been happy with it. Therefore, it, it's not really considered as waste because it's done its job in being the product that I initially uh, uh, bought. Fred, please so conclude, it. yes. <laughs> Sorry? Please come to a conclusion, Fred, please. Of for course, the timing. Yes. I've got two more slides. Um, and so the good thing is that we have no more tools. Uh, the good thing is that behavior science has brought quite a lot of understanding on how we can both uh, uh, understand barriers to doing the behavior and but also a number of solutions and perhaps uh, uh, quickly to show you so a couple of examples of two programs which i think are quite interesting one of these programs was done in sweden and called fix the stuff which aimed at increasing uh, you know the lifespan of, of uh, products like clothing furniture electronic equipment and uh, what uh, they did was to combine a number of behavior change interventions to support people doing these behaviors, playing on the, uh, the community to encourage the behavior and then making it uh, physically simpler and easier to do the behavior. And a similar program by Yale, which I think is really interesting, it's called Spring Salvage. And they play on an interesting technique that's called the window of opportunity. So that's basically uh, playing on moments uh, throughout the year, moments in people's life where they are more flexible to adopting new behaviors. Like spring, for instance, the big uh, spring clean is an opportunity and a, a moment to encourage people to adopt uh, new behaviors. And so to keep in mind for your uh, projects later on is that with behavior science, uh, it brings you solutions that you can that can consider both the technical, but also importantly the human factors that you that you can then use intentionally to encourage uh, sustainable behaviors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, it's uh, I think it's really important to look at these issues from let's say a more sociological. Uh, perspective and anthropological perspective like you're doing and um, looking at waste in general not just reuse and repair through the three lenses that you've presented social contextual and individual and thinking about and understanding how these influence a person uh, I think is really inspirational and uh, can be something that everybody uh, brings home with them uh, I also really liked uh, the intentional behavioral gap that you've presented. Uh, I think that's very true and it uh, shows us again, as with many uh, solutions in sustainability, that we have to make it uh, easy and normal uh, for, these yeah. um, for these things to be really adopted. Um, um, well, we have some questions in the chat, but I also wanted to um, to ask you if you should pinpoint one action that a municipality could uh, perhaps start their journey uh, towards changing behaviors uh, of their citizens towards reuse and repair or waste prevention. Uh, what what would it be? So I, I think there's maybe a couple of words that I can use to uh, to respond. It's co-creation and combination. What I mean by that is um, an important aspect of putting in place such program is that it's for them to be to be uh, you know as effective and accepted uh, as possible. And so. Uh, as you design this program, uh, it's really important to uh, consider, of course, the more uh, operational, technical, uh, legislat legislative aspects, but also to make sure that they are uh, co-created uh, co and defined together with the people who you want to involve in, in using them. And so being able to involve the different stakeholders in creating your solution is, is going to help define better programs. And very often uh, there is a bit of a one plus one equals three sort of effect when you use uh, that sort of behavior change interventions. Uh, as in, if you can combine them in one program, you're going to also have uh, uh, increased the impact 
or the likely impact of your program. So combination and co-creation are two uh, keywords, I think. Thank you very much. So I'm looking at the chat and I think we have a question from Renee. Um, but what is nudging and is this concept to encourage circular behaviors? Yeah, so, so nudging is a, is a technique that's about uh, guiding people towards uh, a specific choice without preventing them from opting for another option if they would like to. If, if, if I can, I guess the slides are going to be distributed later on, but you might, you might remember I saw a wheel with different types of intervention. Essentially, essentially uh, the, the great thing today is that we have a more complete, a bigger toolbox to influence people's behavior. So one of them is legislation, one of them is providing information. It could also be communication campaigns. Nudging is one of them, but there are also other techniques to be used. And so, and so instead of using, uh, for instance, communication, uh, communication as the end goal, it's only a tool at your disposal and you can tap into a bigger, more complete box of solutions depending on your uh, context. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fred. And uh, now I would like to invite our second keynote speaker, uh, Edward de Bordo from Reuse, who will share with us some ideas on how local authorities can create a use and repair economy. So Eduardo, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Magda, yeah, for giving me the floor, giving me the opportunity to speak at this event and also for organizing it. It's great to see so many people uh, being interested because it is an important topic. Try to, yeah, to share my screen now. Hopefully it will uh, go well. Do you all see the screen? Okay, that's great. So, yeah, I guess we can start. So really, thanks a lot uh, yeah, for being here, for inviting me. Uh, I'm Eduardo Bodo. I'm the Environment Policy Officer for Reuse. And we are uh, an international network representing social enterprises active in the circular economy. We currently represent almost uh, 1,000 social enterprises in the wider network, uh, and we're active in uh, 29 countries. And uh, on this uh, slide here, which uh, will be redistributed, so I won't spend too much time, but you can see some data about the combined environmental, social, and economic impact of the activities of uh, our members. Now, uh, moving on, why is reuse and repair uh, so important? What are the benefits? Uh, well, there are different. One, uh, the most obvious one is that through reuse and repair, we can extend the durability of a product and keep them in the economy longer and out of the waste stream. So there is a big waste uh, prevention aspect here. Uh, another uh, is about environmental protection and the favoring reuse and repairs allows to bypass the environmental impact caused by the production of new items. And uh, this is basically, yeah, the core idea of the circular economy. So a more efficient use of uh, resources and energy. It is, uh, however, important to, to understand and keep in mind that the circular economy is more than just recycling because recycling is still has a higher environmental impact that we use, it's not as efficient, and also it's particularly difficult for some waste stream as of now. For instance, textiles, uh, only 1% of textiles in Europe are recycled. Also, there is the issue that a lot of reusable products and still end up being recycled. So this is something that we should try to prevent. One other aspect, uh, which is uh, sometimes uh, overlooked, uh, is that uh, reuse also leads to job creation. And we're not talking about any job, we're talking about green and local jobs. And according to data for our network, uh, this can uh, vary from 70 to 140 jobs, depending on the data, on the nature of the waste that is uh, collected. Another benefit uh, in the case of uh, social enterprises that we represent uh, is the integration of people distanced from the labor market. So through reuse jobs, they can acquire the necessary skill to start to contribute again to the economy. So these are the benefits of reuse and repair. However, there are also quite a few barriers. And the most important one is cost. Well, we established that reuse uh, create jobs and repair, of course, but this labor has a cost, especially when competing with uh, large manufacturers that uh, impose legal and technological barriers to the repair of their products. Also, 
unfortunately, not everything can be reused. And uh, this is becoming even more of a problem because of lower durability. And uh, so there is always some residual uh, waste, which is a cost. And uh, this is also something uh, that, uh, yeah, it's uh, the, that is a barrier, an economic barrier to reuse and repair. There are quite a few initiatives being discussed right now at the European level, but it will take time and proper implementation before they can produce uh, concrete changes that are also felt at the local level. One way in which municipality can act, uh, one best practice perhaps, is the use of the repair vouchers, which incentivizes repair by directly lowering the cost of repairs. So it started in the Austrian city of Graz in 2017, and then it was replicated um, at both national, regional, and city level, even going as far as Portland, uh, USA. And uh, the Austrian uh, bonus, which is now on a national level, uh, finances basically 50% of the repair cost up to 200 euros per repair. And uh, yeah, you can see some data here that is financed from the recovery fund. And also since its implementation in Vienna in 2020, it has been uh, very successful in fostering a culture of repair with good uh, uh, positive benefits on the environment, but also on local businesses. Another important element is sustainable public procurement, which can help uh, really drive up the demand for reuse and refurbished product. And it's important here to understand that reused uh, refurbished product does not mean lower quality because uh, uh, um, high standard, uh, high procedures are implemented uh, by our networks and reuse operators in order to guarantee the quality and the safety of uh, these products. And uh, we also have some particularly good example, one regarding upcycled furniture for an Irish uh, waste agency and another regarding uh, textile collect collection in the city of Antwerp uh, here in Belgium done by social enterprises. So I think it's really uh, important uh, in procurement to have a flexible approach to go beyond the lowest uh, price criterion and also consider environmental and social benefits. So. In this way, procurement can become an investment in a more sustainable and inclusive future rather than just a voice in the budget and just an expense. Another very important topic is the issue of extended producer responsibility. And according to a lot of EU studies on the issues, these EPR schemes right now are too heavily focused on recycling and they do not support reuse and repair, you know, which is really a missed opportunity. To, because there are ways to, to finance uh, reuse and repair activities through both the EPR fees, but also to incentivize the design of uh, products through eco-modulation. And uh, it is important that these EPR schemes are also more inclusive and uh, based on a dialogue between uh, municipalities, uh, producers, but also uh, reuse and recycling actors. And uh, this is particularly important uh, in 2025, where the separate collection obligation for textiles will uh, be mandatory in the EU. And right now, only 1% of textiles is uh, being recycled. So it's really important that uh, we focus more on um, also the upper stages of the waste hierarchy. And we have, uh, I put here some true examples of how uh, through successful uh, EPR schemes, uh, we can finance some innovative uh, uh, reuse uh, and repair uh, models. One is the repair trucks used by Solidanza in the social enterprises active in Catalonia. And these are uh, mobile uh, self repair trucks that help uh, teaching citizens uh, how to fix and maintain their products. So it's not only about the repair, but also about teaching citizens uh, on how to do the repair themselves. Another element, another example is also the Ecocentri managed by the Cooperativa Insieme, a social enterprise based in Vicenza, which cooperates with municipal authorities to increase reuse in municipal waste collection facilities by sens also sensibilizing the people on the importance of reuse, but uh, also sorting out potentially reusable items from the waste stream. So these uh, items can become a source of, uh, of income and uh, rather than a cost for uh, municipality. And they can also finance a very important uh, local programs on the territory. Yeah, so basically this, this was my slide. I have here a short summary of what uh, we discussed. 
And uh, the main takeaway, if there is one from this presentation, is that we need to go beyond a narrow view of the circular economy as just recycling and rather preventing waste at the source through reuse and repair. And uh, also municipalities here, I think they have a key role to play and local governments in general, because the consequences of uh, the linear economies are felt at the local level and the benefits would also be felt at the local level. So indeed, let's all work together towards a more circular future. Yeah, thank you for your attention, for listening. I'll be happy to take your questions, if any. Thank you, Eduardo, um, for this interesting presentation, for sharing the benefits and barriers of uh, reuse and repair, and also for all the examples um, that are very inspirational. Um, I will jump to the questions that we have already. Um, there is a question from Zoe. Uh, is shifting taxation to raw materials instead of labor under discussion in the mentioned initiatives? Yes, indeed, this is something that we advocate for. And uh, yeah, I unfortunately, yeah, 10 minutes is not enough to list all the possible uh, items, but indeed, yeah, it's something that would be valuable to reduce our material footprint. It's a good point. Thank you. Then uh, the next question is, has there been any discussion on market distortion in a connection to repair, uh, repair vouchers? Not as far as I'm aware. Also, it's important that, yeah, the voucher is um, a direct subsidy rather than some kind of uh, tax reduction. So there is also less uh, uh, market distortion in this sense. And uh, so, no, not that I'm aware. Thank you. And then the last question, is repair coupon a sustainable way if the local government has to take care of the cost? So meaning financially sustainable way, I guess. Sure, sure yeah. There is no doubt about the environmental sustainability, I hope, but indeed about financial sustainability. It's, uh, yeah, uh, based on the experience in Austria when where this uh, river voucher uh, was born. We actually see that, yeah, it has been financed by the, um, uh, recovery fund and it's also money that goes back into the local economy supporting repairers and also preventing the costs from the generation of waste so indeed it is a cost but there are there are the funds to cover and the, i think the benefits far outweigh any potential upfront uh, costs perfect thank you very much uh, thank you eduardo thank you fred uh and now, uh, well, we will see you both uh, again. Fred, we will see uh, uh, right here in the, in the first session. Um, so uh, let's move to this one, uh, which is on reuse. And uh, here, Fred will be a discussant. And uh, we will uh, hear the first presentation from Antonio uh, about the closing store Latino Verde. So Antonio, the floor is yours. Uh, hi everyone, this is uh, Antonio from uh, Zaragoza, Spain. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, the project Latino Verde, which is, uh, let's say, a social uh, project dealing with secondhand clothing. So I will share some slices. Uh, so, well, um, the process, uh, we've received some clothes uh, donated by the citizens. We've got like over 270 containers in different parts of, the, of Zaragoza. We, we collect um, over uh, 1,400,000 kilograms. And afterwards, the reusable clothes um, are sold in, the, in this store. So the most important thing there is that the sales team are uh, our colleagues. They are people, social excluded people that are doing a social uh, and labor itinerary to change their lives. So we want to change lives and we, we while we promote the value of recycling, reuse and responsible consumption. Part of this, we are doing, we are um, um, addressing some social needs regarding the clothing. 
from people that come uh, from Caritas and the municipality. Well, part of this, we are this uh, last year, we started some new projects, uh, two workshops. One is a high school. They're repairing some clothing that, uh, that afterwards uh, are sold in the shop. And we deal with the uh, mental health uh, project, but also restyling and repairing some clothing. Part of this, we have um, we are have at the moment two uh, corners in Auchan, and we we at the moment we and other um, social and social companies uh, regarding the secondhand clothing, we created the cooperative in all over Spain. So we share uh, some knowledge and we've got the, the project of uh, sensors. Now all the containers have uh, sensors so we, we can know at the, at the, at the moment uh, how, uh, how many clothes are there. So this is a, a picture now, Latino Verde, it's called Moda Re because we have uh, already changed the, the, the brand because we've got the same brand in all over, in all over, uh, all over Spain. So, okay, and this is the workshop, the mental health uh, project uh, workshop. So they're doing this kind of stuff, which is, uh, so we can sell this stuff and we can explain the, the problems um, of these people, of that people, and uh, those people have. Well, um, one, one minute, Antonio. Okay, yes, and the, the, the data, well, last year, in only in the shop, we over 65,000 uh, uh, garments have been uh, sold, or uh, over 1,000 families uh, have been attended regarding social, um, social and um, clothing need well over 16 well 16 people have been from the beginning have been doing the itinerary or um, the half of well seven people are still in the itinerary and well the incomes only the information of the income just to let you know that the sales are 255,000 and another uh, approximately 85,000 um, euros are from public and private so subsidy. 80% are public and all the subsidies come from European social fund. So I try to be quick, it's four minutes. It, <laughs> thank you very much. I would like to spend more time, but we, we've got a lot of people to, to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio, you were right on time. <laughs> And uh, okay. thank you for this presentation. Uh, indeed, textile production and waste is a really big issue. And uh, despite uh, the campaigning in recent years, fast, fast fashion is still on the rise and uh, only 1% of textile waste is recycled. So it's really great to see uh, initiatives such as this one. Um, we have a question uh, from Katarina. Um, is, is this not only in uh, Zaragoza, but in all Spain, uh, where did it start and how was it rolled out nationwide? Well, uh, let's say that different characters had different projects. So our project was a Latino Verde, but um, let's say a year well, or a year and a half ago, we decided all the projects of Caritas regarding um, secondhand clothing decided to create a cooperative. And uh, we, in, in other well, in other matters, we decided to have the same brand and to share all the knowledge. So th this Latino Verde it turns out to be a part of this greater project, uh, Moda Red. A part of this, we also collaborate with other social research and companies that have nothing uh, to do with Caritas in local social research and companies. We work also hand by hand. We try to collaborate with everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would also li uh, like to ask Fred if you have um, a short comment or a short question, please. Well, I, I've got both. I, I think the short comment is I think it's a brilliant initiative, especially as it combines uh, environmental benefits with social benefits. Uh, the, the, the idea of employing socially excluded people and, and, and using the initiative to uh, sort of bring them back into society, I think it's a fantastic 
uh, it's a fantastic initiative. Um, and I, I had a question just to make sure I understand correctly. So the, uh, you, uh, another brilliant point is the restyling. You know, you, you showed photo of people like working on, on the clothes. So is that uh, for the per personnel, the sales per uh, the salespeople to be involved with, or is it more for uh, customers, or is it like a third uh, audience? Well, the restyling, the restyling at the moment is being done by, let's say, mental health, uh, people with mental health uh, problems. So the most important thing is that they make some money also, which is apart from the social excluded people. Well, let's say that it is the most important part of their time and in, in their lives is to go to this workshop. It is really fantastic how um, their lives is being changing only for a few, few hours a week and how uh, all uh, their families are very happy with that. So in the, in the shop, also we can explain these other projects and these problems or for mental health people. We, we try not only to talk about, let's say social excluded people, not only to talk about uh, um, secondhand clothing. So we want also to talk about other problems. So we can share their uh, problems and these other projects, we can share this with our uh, customers. And we do that. Okay. Thank you, Antonio. And now I would like to ask uh, my colleague Eugenie to share a poll and uh, everybody from the participants to vote. And we are voting here. Uh, we're looking at the implementation of this good practice, whether it's uh, easy to be implemented or hard to be implemented. And we are also looking at uh, the impact. Does it have a high impact or um, medium impact um, or a low impact. So please uh, vote. Okay, and here now we can see the answers. So most uh, we have most answers that this is uh, medium hard to uh, to implement and uh, it has a high impact. So thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to ask um, our uh, second presenter uh, in this session, uh, Daniel who will talk about the network of reuse centers uh, that uh, they are building in Malta. Uh, so, Danielle, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. And Thank you for the invitation. I just need, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, as we said, we are the uh, National Waste Agency and the scope. Uh, of our companies basically to create resources from waste. Um, this project is, is one of them, and which we'll be presenting today. So basically what we have done is we have opened four reuse centers, uh, and the scope is to extend the lifetime of uh, products, which would have ended up as waste if we had not managed to put them in these new centers. So the concept developed um, around uh, June of 2020. We were seeing that we are receiving good quality products. So in, in some instances, even items which were close to new, in some instances also they were still sealed, where um, inhabitants, householders, wanted to dispose of these products in our collection centers. So the idea was that we would find a solution to divert these items away from landfill. And the concept of these reuse centers was developed. And we started with the procurement process where um, we also applied for EU funding and we managed to also secure EU funding in line with the cohesion funding program of 2014-2020. And these centers are uh, 
as I said, offering used and pre-loved items that still hold value and can be reused. These centers, we also kept the proximity principle where we've built these centers within our own collection centers. Therefore, individuals who have items which they do not have any use for, but can be potentially reused, um, they are invited to place these items in these drop-off points as shown in the image in this slide. And our staff will then evaluate if these items um, do make sense to be placed on the shelves of the reuse centers, and therefore they can be placed in these reuse centers. Obviously, as has also been mentioned um, previously in other presentations, this project is contributing to the circular economy whereby we are reducing landfilling, saving energy, and also using less natural resources. So um, the investment in these reuse centers is around 170,000 euros. We have a total of four centers. So in Malta, we are an archipelago of three main islands. Two are mainly inhabited. We have Malta, which is the largest um, island where we have three reuse centers. Uh, and Gozo, we have one. The items that can be accepted and also made available are as can be seen in these in these photos so you can have toys books bicycles scooters jigsaw puzzle, puzzles small pieces of furniture uh, pieces of wood where um, we can also put them back in uh, into the economy and instead of firewood mirrors um, and other items which can like for example soft toys which can be seen in um, uh, in the attached image can you um, come, come to conclusion? Thank sure. Uh, so from the donation, so, um, for individuals to uh, procure or, or um, get these items, there, there is a donation. And uh, in fact, since our opening of the first use center, which was in June of last year, um, we've opened all the reuse centers and we've had close to 4,000 visitors. The items required are now over 4,500 items, and these donations um, make up close to 10,000 euros. We see this project as having a twofold uh, benefit, both an environmental benefit, because we are obviously reducing items going to landfill and also saving energy, as we've discussed before, but also there is a social and positive impact where we are helping NGOs by these donations being given to NGOs to carry out CSR activities mainly environmental uh, initiatives and also there is the direct job creation and also the indirect job creation due to this project thank you from my end thank you daniel um for a very nice presentation for sharing your project um reuse centers are well popping up increasingly across europe so uh it's great and we definitely need to see more of them and uh, well encourage uh, public and citizens to use them as well. Uh, Fred, I would like to ask you to uh, well for a short comment and a question. Yeah, so so uh, maybe two comments or two two key words that I thought were really interesting in in, in the presentation from from Daniel. One is is um, proximity. Uh, because of course, you know, if it's closer, it's also easier for people to uh, to be involved. And you know, let's not underestimate the you know the the, 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 the that sort of practical considerations. And the other one is pre-loved, uh, which is so interesting because it is very is very much framing things in a more positive and also emotional term, which can also increase the appeal of, of the program. So I think it's a really interesting way of talking about it. Uh, I, a question I was I, I, I wanted to ask is, what, what, what is the key challenge? Is it more a supply or demand challenge? So is it that you have like a lot of products coming and so the challenge is how do we sell them? Or is it that uh, you, you need to uh, you need to make sure you keep feeding the beast and, and the challenge is more on receiving, uh, keeping receiving uh, items from people. Um, the, the challenge is, is uh, our boat. Um, we have a situation where we, especially at the beginning when we launched, we were receiving a lot and a lot of items. In fact, prior to launch, we had obviously done some PR campaigns and we were receiving material even before the reuse centers were actually um, 
opened, we also had close to three uh, 40 foot containers full of material. And we had a situation, a big challenge where, for example, we were receiving a lot and a lot of bicycles. There is a finite amount of bicycles, for example, uh, that can be re um, uh, acquired by, uh, by the users of these reuse centers. Uh, therefore, there was sort of um, an oversupply. There was, there was also uh, the challenge of um, receiving material which was still sealed and packed in, in uh, its own packaging. So there, were, um, uh, there, was, there was an issue with uh, evaluating this material. There's also as well, yes, to keep up with um, the, uh, the requirements of the public, our clients, if you can say, um, because obviously you have a finite amount of space and people are always coming in and asking um, what new products you have. So you also, although it's not a traditional shop, you still need to keep the interest going. So you need to have new products coming in so that people can, can acquire them uh, as well. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, we have quite a, a lot of questions, so I will um, well, always ask you the question and I will ask you for just uh, a short, uh, brief answers and then you can answer uh, more in the chat if you feel like. Uh, so we have a question uh, from Felipe. Uh, what is the process of deciding which products uh, are to be kept and which uh, should not be kept? Okay, so obviously it depends on the type of, uh, of product or material. Um, there is a procedure, we've created an internal procedure to identify uh, KPIs of this, these products. For example, if we have received textiles, um, if these are unwearable or unreusable, they will obviously be, be discard, discarded, unfortunately. We also have, um, if these products are not safe for use, we obviously uh, cannot put them on the shelves. Um, and obviously we, we follow a certain procedure in order to have the continuity across the whole uh, four use center. So not one use center, you are using one procedure uh, and then the other you are using uh, another procedure. Thank you. Uh, what is done with the items that cannot be accepted? Uh, for example, because of safety or uh, because because it's uh, yes, yeah. uh, obviously, um, for example, we had a situation where we were receiving a lot of we uh, because people thought it would. It still works, but I, I'm fed up of it. Um, what we've done is we've uh, we cannot accept that material. However, and as well, there's the proximity principle. Um, in these collection points, we have we also receive we coming in from uh, from householders. Therefore, um, these are obviously not discarded. They are then sent for uh, re re uh, recycling, basically. Um, uh, and what can be sent for recycling is sent for recycling, which unfortunately cannot be uh, recycled. It will end up um, at, at the current stage uh, landfill. Thank you. Um, are the items uh, in the reuse centers for sale or? Uh... Well, the question is, are there are the items for sale or um, as a gift? So it's well, for example, we have so what we have is we have a price list. So it depends what the item is. Uh, for example, we've in order to also promote um, uh, reading, for example, any books which we receive and are available, they are free of charge. They or um, uh, whilst other products you have, for example, a one euro donation, three euro donation, five euro donation and the list continues going up. For example, small pieces of furniture, you have a donation of 40 euros. Although they are marked as free, um, we still give the opportunity and some in some clients or some, uh, some individuals who come for books and they technically do not need to give this donation, they still would like to give this donation. So we've, um, we've come up with a price list. Thank you. And I will take a last uh, last question, uh, and then we have a couple of more that uh, we will answer in writing. Uh, so, last question from Sylvia: Is this project economically uh, autonomous? No, at the current state, it is not. Um, 
because obviously of the challenges with regards to capex investment mainly and also operational so um uh, all the money so that amount of money that has been um stated for the last couple of months is not contributing towards the autonomy of this the economical uh, autonomy of this project it is being funded by our own operate opex and capex um, and all money made from this project is then invested into environmental initiatives with NGOs. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to uh, invite uh, Benjamin for the last presentation in this session. And uh, he will talk about a network of deposit system initiatives in, in France. So the okay. floor is, is yours, Benjamin. Thank you. Yeah, I will show my screen. Uh... Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Benjamin Thiel from APESA, uh, uh, Technological Center uh, specialized in uh, sustainability in the South of France. And I'm going to present you uh, good practice from um, from the Retrust project uh, called Réseau Consigne, uh, which is a network of deposit systems initiatives. We well know this kind of, of initiative because we work with them on their environmental and territorial impact. So first of all, some works, uh, some words about uh, the context uh, in France. Uh, in France, uh, as in uh, many European countries, the deposit for reuse. Uh, gradually disappeared in the 80s. And, but uh, recently, reuse of packaging has seen a new boom uh, because of the development of operators who collect, wash, and make available reuse of packaging. In France, there is also a strong uh, new regulation called AGEC. So it's a regulation for circular economy and, well, against waste, with some objectives, such as um, 10% uh, of reuse packaging in 2027 and, uh, and uh, 20% reduction of single-use plastic packaging in, uh, in 2025 and the prohibition of single-use packaging uh, in 2040, so a strong uh, regulation. And if we speak about um, the deposit system, so I, I imagine that it's a well-known uh, system, uh, it's very simple. It's just to the idea is to collect, uh, wash, put back into circulation packaging in order to avoid uh, recycling uh, cycle. As an example, a reusable glass bottle can be reused up to uh, 30 to 50 times before uh, being recycled. So it's very really interesting. Uh, if we if we if we focus on the on the deposits. Uh, it's the core uh, principle of the deposit system. The deposit, it's the additional, the additional sum paid by the consumer in order to ensure the return of packaging uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the deposit system. If we want to, uh, to have more detail about this network, Réseau Consigne, so it's an association uh, who federates uh, stakeholders of reuse of packaging in France. What is interesting is that there is project, project orders, there is operators of the real sector, there is producers, such as uh, beer producers, for example, suppliers for equipment, so washing machines, label printers, and so on. And there is four main objectives. The first one is to support project orders. We want to implement deposit systems um, and reuse packaging. Uh, to animate network of actors, there is a lot of documents about good practices of experiences and so on. Uh, a strong aspect is to support the evolution of the policies to promote and facilitate the development of deposit systems with local authorities and, and more globally to promote the reuse of packaging with citizens and professionals. Uh, other uh, practical details. So it was created in 2000 and in, uh, in more or less 2009, uh, more, uh, more or less. And the structures and as, as an association, there is uh, three years ago, more or less. There is around uh, 80 members 
So operators, um, industrial washers, producers, distributors, and so on. And now there is two employees. Uh, and there is uh, three main uh, learning potential. The first one is more uh, is globally to, to, to have a network of project holders of individuals, companies, around a strong initiative to promote the core economy and to avoid uh, the recycling system to move towards a reuse, uh, a reuse system. What is interesting is uh, the value chain logic. There is not only the project holder, but there is all the value chain from operators, project holders, uh, to, uh, to distributors and uh, providers of, uh, of washing machines and so on, so suppliers. Uh, and the the, uh, the the third strong aspect in this kind of uh, initiative is that they really want to support policies and call of projects. For example, in my region, uh, so the Nouvelle Aquitaine region in the, in the southwest of France, they are strong. They are part of the call of project of the OTs uh, of the national call of projects. So well, they they really support project holders in order to, uh, to, to develop these uh, deposit systems. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, well, reusable packaging is definitely on the rise. And um, so is the call for deposit systems, not only for reusable packaging, but also for single use packaging and for the uh, creation of uh, a system where recycled material is used back in the original products. Uh, but uh, when it comes to reusable packaging, it's always important to consider the total carbon footprint. And uh, I would be well, it would be interesting to know if you help your members in, in any way, um, or for example, with calculating the environmental impacts uh, using LCA, for example. Yeah, uh, I well, it's a very good question. We work on the life cycle assessment. Uh, of one initiative uh, named Consign in the Society of France um, to uh, to have um, uh, to, to have subvention to have national subvention initiatives have to uh, to develop their their uh, environmental impact. So it's a, it's a, it's an obligation for this kind of initiative. Above all, because we know that the, in this initiative there is a strong impact. Uh, that is the logistic uh, phase. The logistic, the logistic phase. So there is a lot of uh, of transport of of bottles, for example, is really very really important. And in some initiatives, it's more important that uh, that the advantage than the, uh, the advantage of uh, reuse of bottles. So it's an obligation for this kind of initiative to to do their environmental impact. And uh, there is yes, there is uh, in this uh, network. There is some documents about how to how to reduce the impact of the logistic because it's a, it's a major impact and and uh, and on uh, on other stages. But well, it's it's very complicated to implement it, uh, above all because the logistic it's a very uh, strong uh, strong aspect and difficult aspect to uh, to manage. But well, there is uh, some uh, some support to uh, to do this. Thank you. And, and Fred, uh, I would like to ask you to, if you can ask a very short question, please. Yeah, so I, um, I think this project is, is a great example that uh, for things to work, we need the right, uh, you know, uh, operational solution, but we also need uh, uh, consumers to, to be involved and to remain involved because one challenge is for, you know, is to drive adoption so that mm -hmm. more people are going to use the service. But then also, people uh, also the other one is also for people to keep using the service because when with programs around reusable packaging, there can be some uh, wear out effect where people start using it and then over time they use it less and less. And I, I was wondering, I was wondering, Benjamin, if you've if you've measured similar uh, wear out effects or and if yes, have you been able to do anything about it? Yeah, uh, so it's clear that uh, we have to, uh, there is a need to involve um, uh, consumers in this kind of, of initiative. This is why, for example, in the Society of France, the initiative uh, is now developed as a cooperative in order to really involve the consumers in, the, in this kind of initiative. And as you, uh, as you say, uh, when, you, when we perform, uh, perform an LCA, 
uh, an, an environmental assessment of this initiative, the use phase is also important because the user uh, will uh, will transport the bottle, but only uh, we will go to the shop to uh, to have a bottle only uh, only for this bottle. So the the transport is very really, very really important and has a strong impact. And uh, well, maybe the the the, the shortcoming of this initiative is that uh, project orders only focus on technological aspects because it's very really important. And uh, <laughs> I think you 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 will know this, this aspect, but the behavior aspect is still uh, missing in this kind of, of initiative. And uh, in, if we really want to uh, to reduce the environmental impact, there will be a strong uh, a strong work to do uh, to say to uh, to users your transport to 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 your your logistic to transport the bottle is really really impacting, and you have to uh, to reduce it and uh, to manage it uh, differently. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't see a lot of literature about uh, behavior, behavior aspects in uh, deposit systems. There is, uh, I, I didn't see a lot of, uh, of literature. So well, there is, a, <laughs> there is a work to do now. Thank you, thank you, Benjamin. And um, now we will uh, be the vote. We forgot to vote last time, so uh, I will ask my colleague Evgenie and. Um, I will ask Eugenie if the poll uh, that we will be voting on is for Malta or if it's for the practice that we've just heard, uh, because I'm not sure if... Uh, Magda, we can do both. Okay, so let's vote on the good practice that we just heard from Benjamin, um, and then we will vote on the one that we've heard before. Okay, so we are voting on the network of reusable packaging organizations that we have the presentation we have just heard. And again, we are voting on uh, the implementation of the good practice, whether it's easy or difficult, and the impact of this good practice, whether it's high or it's low. And we uh, we were we are collecting all of your answers, and then at the end of the workshop, we will have a matrix with all the uh, good practices and the votes that you have posted in. Okay, and here we can see the results. Uh, so the implementation is somewhere in between medium and difficult, and the impact is uh, you have voted as high. So thank you very much, Eugenie. And now we can go to our next poll. And uh, we will vote on the network of reuse centers. So um, the good practice that we've seen before um, from Danielle on the reuse centers in Malta. Okay, thank you very much for the votes. And here we, you see the implementation is uh, medium difficult and uh, very high impact. So perfect. Thank you very much for, uh, for voting in the polls. Uh, thank you also to all of our speakers in this first panel. So Antonio, Daniel, and Benjamin, and thank you Fred for your comments and uh, questions and for acting as a discussant um, in this session. Uh, so now we will take a short break uh, and uh, we'll be back here at 1525 uh, with our panel on repair. So thank you very much and see you in a bit. So hello everyone. I hope you had a little bit of time to take a break and uh, get a refreshment maybe. And uh, so we're really happy uh, after this uh, exciting first session uh, on reuse that we can now also uh, discuss um, on repair, which is uh, the other, let's say, pillar that we need uh, for the prevention of waste. So we have a, a, a nice little um, panel. Again, uh, the principle is the same. So you can all come back online. And um, before we are giving the word to, uh, to Ariane, who can already bring up her presentation, 
Uh, I just wanted to say, yes, we do have a database of good practices because we have this question um, and uh, we can also send you an individual uh, information with uh, some selected good practices. And uh, we have the policy brief that was presented by Magda at the beginning where you can find loads and loads of interesting information on reuse and repair. And we will have recordings and all presentations available. So lots of information for you to browse through also later. So with this, uh, our first presentation is coming from uh, Ariane Julien uh, on the Reparateur. So please, the word is yours. Hello, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's really, really interesting since uh, this afternoon. So um, I will present you uh, Reparacteur. Uh, so uh, this is a brand that belongs to La Chambre de Métier de l'Artisana, which is a public institution that registers craftsmen. And uh, Reparacteur, so it's a national brand which belongs uh, to CMA and concerned craftsmen who repair everyday objects. So it uh, excludes building and car repair sectors. The brand exists since 2000, 2012, and it is locally developed. In our region, the network began in 2015 with the support of the French Ecological Transition Agency and our regional council. Until 2021, actions were led irregularly. Then uh, La Chambre de Métier de l'Artisanat adopted a new strategy with a 100% dedicated network manager, which is me. The goal of the brand is highlighting the range of professions helping to extend items lifespan. Those professions can be found on an online directory so people can remind them and look for them. Reparateur contributes to the maintenance and valorization of repair crafts and to the survival of small businesses, helping to give them visibility. It also contributes to encourage people adopting sustainable reflex in their consumption habits. The brand has two targets, repair craftsmen and consumers. The online directory, classifies professions into 12 categories, for example, furniture, household items, leather products, or miscellaneous category, pictured by the umbrella, in which the unclassifiable um, items are listed. So concerning my, the network, my missions are based on a three years regional plan that includes four aims. So the first is to increase the popularity of the repair craft sector by increasing the number of companies that sign the Reparateur Commitment Charter. With this charter, they commit to, to respect responsible waste management and to promote Repair Act over buying new products. So, uh, we can see that uh, in uh, 2000, uh, 2022, uh, there are almost uh, 500 uh, labeled out of the uh, 12,000 eligible. So it's okay, but there are a big uh, marge, uh, if I can say like that, uh, before to reach the uh, entirely uh, craftsmen uh, eligible. The second aim uh, is to push network autonomy and solidarity by strengthening relationship between members. So it goes by uh, connection uh, in local and in uh, and by look uh, by regional meetings. Uh, so physically and uh, in uh, by video conference or uh, by a social uh, network. So all, um, all tools are good to make them um, encounter. The just, third... one mi just one minute, please. Yes, yeah? okay. So the third aim is to increase awareness about Reparateur and uh, the fourth is to help the Reparateur being recognized 
by local governments and getting advantages. So I will conclude on challenges uh, that our countries have to face. Uh, the European Commission began to work on some repair sector issues, such as uh, the premature obsolescence, but a lot of efforts remains to be done, whether it is for vocational training or to encourage repair. For example, you have a specific VAT on repair acts, which is the same as manufactured products. Because of this, repair is too expensive compared to manufactured products. So it doesn't incite consumers to fix their item, quite the opposite. To conclude, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And of course, uh, don't hesitate if you have uh, any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariane, for an interesting presentation and for showing us how you're building this uh, um, network of craftsmen. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, as you said, there's still a long way to go to uh, get uh, as many as possible into the network and uh, or accredited or labeled. I don't know how this is uh, called, but um, so yes, uh, maybe I can give the word directly to Eduardo for some questions. Um, maybe you can just go ahead first. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Astrid. And also thanks a lot, Ariane, for the very interesting presentation. It was uh, yeah, really interesting to hear that also in France, uh, where we think uh, that repair legislation is uh, relatively advanced compared to other European countries, we have a repair score, which is already applied. Uh, yet you still face uh, a lot of the same issues as repairers everywhere, mostly that the repair is still expensive. So I wanted to learn, uh, you, you mentioned the, some barriers to, to repair, but I wanted to know how your network uh, is trying to concretely overcome this barrier. What Repacteurs uh, is doing in this regard? I think it would be very interesting. Um, the charter engaged them uh, to sensibilize uh, all public, all clients. So when uh, I, I find a place, uh, for instance, uh, in an event where they can uh, show uh, their uh, craft, uh, craft art, <laughs> um, so they have to explain uh, uh, their uh, engagement, their, uh, the, the, uh, how to say, uh, mm -hmm. The, the commitment and uh, how they, they uh, where is their place into this uh, circular economy? And because the public doesn't know really uh, all uh, the professions that can repair all those objects. And the, the aim is that each reparator speak for everyone, every, every repair craftsman. So, also for them, but also for the others. And to remember uh, people that uh, they, can, uh, they can go everywhere uh, proxy, uh, in local, uh, like uh, they are all craftsmen of proximity. And Reparator try also to remember that the proximity makes also economy and uh, environmental uh, economy. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in- Savings. You know, why? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for my English. It's not so brilliant as you. <laughs> we understand you perfectly. With Eduardo? Did it uh, answer to the question? Yes, indeed. It was quite clear. And uh, no worries. Your English was perfect. No worries at all. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Aria. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, you, you also underlined uh, two important points, which we had before. Uh, is like uh, you have uh, to, to make sure there is accessibility. So how to find people, uh, the proximity. Uh, so it shouldn't be too far away, not too difficult uh, to do. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's two points which we will take uh, uh, in the takeaways as well. Uh, and finally, I think, um, uh, what Benjamin has mentioned, uh, you need to have like a whole value chain uh, available and uh, bring all this value chain together so that, uh, that they can act as, as one. So excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, uh, if we, um, well, we have a question. Uh, it says any initiative to foster repairability at design stage, this would reduce the cost of repairing. Are you working on design as well? Maybe for a short answer? 
so uh, I I speak about uh, the training um, uh, training uh, repair uh, crafts, uh, but uh, to be labelized, uh, craftsmen have to uh, to participate to one day of uh, like training, but it's training um, uh, to get the speech to get. Uh, uh, to understand in which domain uh, they are, uh, they belong. Uh, so the circular economy domains, and uh, th this is an intuition uh, that they have, but they don't have the words. And uh, this day is um, is also to make them uh, meetings, uh, meeting, uh, but also to learn about uh, all their own sector, repair sector. And, uh, and also there, there is a part of uh, marketing to help them uh, to have, um, uh, I mean, a, a commercial reflex uh, because oftenly uh, there are people uh, that are really pragmatical and practical, yeah. but not commercial. And so it, this day is to, to help them uh, for that. To help them uh, train in that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think um, the question was leading a little bit also in the direction of eco design. Uh, so maybe we can we can tackle that uh, um, uh, at the end or uh, we can help you in, in writing. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. I think we would like to ask you now again to vote on also this uh, good practice, the reparateur. So um, what do you think about uh, the implementation? Is it rather easy, medium, or difficult to implement? Uh, and what kind of impact is there, um, high, medium, or low? So please vote now. Oh, yeah, let's see. So implementation is... Uh, medium hard we see here or difficult. So 90% think it's uh, difficult. So you see uh, how much uh, admiration we owe you, uh, Ariane, for, for bringing this uh, about. But impact high on medium. So it's a very high impact you can achieve. So uh, thank you very much for this. Um, uh, I think we have uh, seen that we have a lot of high impact initiatives here. So we go to our next one. Um, this time we are going to Austria. And I would like to ask uh, Ulrike Kabosch from Styria uh, to speak to us about the online guide for repair shops. Hello, good afternoon from my side as well. Uh, the good practice uh, example I will present today is the online guide for repair shops. Um, sorry, how to go to the... Yes. Uh, what was the objective? Why we, we uh, implemented this kind of project? Uh, the, the goal of the, or the main objective was to create an easy way for the, uh, for the population to find qualified repair shops in their area close to their home or their household. And the overall goal, goal was to promote uh, repair, ser repair services instead of new purchase uh, to prolong the lifespan of products like it was in the, in the last example from from Julian as, as well, or Ariane, I, I don't know, it was the first, what was the second name, sorry. Um, what was the basic um, from our project? We introduced uh, the online guide for repair shops um, in 2012. There was the first uh, online launch in, uh, launch in cooperation with uh, waste, uh, Big Waste Management Association from Western Austria. It called ATM Abfallwirtschaft Tirol Mitte. They did the technical operation and we were part of the project. Um, um, the, the, the online guide was in this time since 2012, it's more than 10 years, it was revised several times and updated because we always had to, 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 to be in time with our design on the one hand, but also uh, to update it on, in a technical, on a technical basis. Um, uh, we revised it many times and it got extended to other federal states as well. As well. In the beginning, it was just Tyrol and, and Styria, where I come from. And nowadays, it's seven out of nine federal states who are part of this uh, online uh, guide for repair shops. Um, 
it is what is very important the, the, um, to use the online guide. It's free of charge for all users. On the one hand, for the population who, who is searching for repair services on this website, but it's also free of charge for all repair shops who register themselves on, on the website. Um, just shortly about the access statistics. Uh, in the last two years, we had um, 21,400 unique users on our um, repair guide. Uh, and uh, all together in all seven participating federal states, it was 183,000 and, uh, yeah, and 600. Um, and in Styria, in the last two days, uh, the page was, was hit uh, 77,000 times. So um, what, what is the online uh, guide for repair shops? It's a, it's a search, let's say a search engine for repair services. Uh, in our case for Styria, uh, we have 11 categories of repair services on our uh, online guide with 68 subcategories. Um, you can see here the categories, it's like textiles or toys and, and, and sports equipment. Um, the third one is camera and uh, optical uh, appliances and so on. So it's a lot of different kinds uh, of, 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 of um, categories and they all, as you can see on the right side, they have uh, subcategories. Uh, like, for example, this is uh, a technical category, uh, which is opened up here, and there is one subcategory called computers and networks and, and printers, and another one is called um, consoles and um, electric um, toys. And, and so on. So there are many, many. Ulrike, just just one minute, please. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, and we we have five thousand uh, different kind of offers. What what you can repair in these kind of uh, um, shops, uh, repair shops. Um, wh what is the content in in every? How how does uh, a single repair shop describe themselves on the page? There is a it's an interactive uh, search uh, searching function on a map. Uh, and you can find the description of the company, the contact details, the opening hours. The, uh, and since 2016, we have also a blog on the page and um, a pronouncement of our repair cafes when they take place and where. Um, that's the most important slide. Um, what were the resources we needed to set up this uh, website? Uh, the starting costs were between 15 and 20,000 euro. It depends on what was your pre-system uh, and what, what you can already bring into the, into the starting uh, from the pre-system. Um, we had a simple online directory and the kind of index, and we had to do a lot of technical work, so it was not that cheap. Um, you have to update the website at least every five years, and that's around 17,000 euro in total uh, every five years. Um, what is very important is the data maintenance, and, data, um, and uh, in our case, um, the, no, not just in our case, the, the whole system is working like that, that uh, um, uh, the repair shops who are registered themselves on the website, they get an email um, and automatically uh, they get the email every half year. And then they have to enter the system. They have to check their data if they are still um, uh, correct or if anything changed like opening hours or contact details and if they don't do this um, do this uh, um, um, log in to the to the website they get deleted from the website they get an email and they have to check the data and if it, this is just to uh, prevent that the, the online guide will um, develop to a data cemetery we say in German it's just out outrated data and no one can use it please please conclude yes yeah, yeah, and the conclusion is uh, our learnings. What is very important uh, was the responsive design for the use of the website because people like to use it with a mobile phone. Uh, the automated update is very in, uh, important that, that it uh, is uh, that you can keep it actual with, without a lot of work. Um, then uh, there was one time we, we started a kind of uh, funding for repair services and it was linked to the repair guide because we just funded vouchers from um, from companies who were registered on the online guide and this uh, um, um, lead to a big increase of our members 
this was very uh, um, useful for the for the website to have this this uh, um, parallel this um, repair fundings for services. Um, and very important uh, the learnings uh, that's the, the, the uh, important learnings but what is also very important to uh, to uh, if you want to implement it is that someone has to start the implementation that's the main point and someone has to care for the system so you need a commitment uh, for, for uh, from from all stakeholders of your region region you need a lot of public relation work so that the uh, population knows that this uh, online guide is existing. You need an, an proper financing for it uh, and the central administration. Um, and in our case, the release and the uh, overall uh, editorial is done by the regional government, by my office. And that's around 100 uh, working hours per year. Yeah, uh, but all in all, it's easy to transfer. The transferability is easy uh, and it just depends on the costs are very uh, yeah. intensive uh, uh, depending on what was your pre-system and are you doing your individual personal programming or are you using uh, ready-made software for example so that's it sorry for <laughs> taking thank too you. much time <laughs> thank you thank you very much i think it's a, a very exciting uh, project so and there's lots of things to say about it and yeah uh, i think uh, people will be grateful also that you're sharing some figures uh, on how this can be how, how this can be done um uh, just a first uh well you already mentioned the collaboration with the vouchers so i think yeah. uh, if there's uh, we have questions for vouchers and i hope we can ask you this uh, for qualification later um so that uh, maybe we can also uh, cover that um and uh, we have a question on how do you monitor the impact in relation of ex extending the lifetime of the products? Are you able to do this? Maybe a short answer? Um, the, the, we can measure it by seeing how many products get repaired or, uh, via this um, um, online guide. Um, and and uh, especially when we had this funding scheme, it was easy to see uh, what kind of, of appliances and products uh, were repaired. Uh, this was the one on the one hand, and and yes, yeah, that's the main uh, indicator. I would say it's the main thing so, you can see that, but that's yeah. excellent already. So yeah. thank you, thank you very much for 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 doing that. And um, the other question was on maintaining and updating the information. You explained that very well. Um, who is not updating is being thrown out. Excellent. Yes. yes. So maybe we go to to uh, Eduardo. Um, do you have also a question? Well, yeah, uh, very briefly, uh, we are familiar with this project because Reuse uh, was also involved, uh, although, yeah, before uh, yes. uh, I started working here. So it's great, yeah, to know that it's proceeding uh, so well. We also have a map on our website. We know how much work uh, it goes in. And it's true that uh, consumers are not informed uh, enough about Logar River, which is also what the previous presentation was about. One very quick question, as you mentioned it uh, before, Ulrike, but I wanted to know more about the possibilities of uh, upscaling this project to the national or perhaps in the future even European level or to replicate in other uh, yeah, uh, local uh, levels? I think the transferability is very easy to do. Um, the, and as I said, the, the main uh, point is if you have a person who cares for it, who, who, who cares for the implementation, who, who collects the commitment in the region and who is searching for the financing of the, of the, of the system, that's the main point. And, and of course, that's that you have to, uh, that this is a long-term project. You can, it's not enough if you just set it up once and then you leave it like it is, you have to care for it and you have to update it. And that's why we, we choose this uh, uh, possibility of self-updating by the, by the companies. Uh, and I think it's very easy to, to, to transfer it. It's just a matter of financing and technical um, solutions but thank the you, solutions are existing let's say <laughs> thank you very much we have a question if you could share please kindly the link in the chat that would be yes great. I do. Um, yeah. uh, we also have uh, some uh, hints on, on 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 a similar initiative in in belgium so uh, you could uh, have a look at that as well mm -hmm. and uh, so we would like uh, everybody now to vote also on uh, on this um repair shops online guide
All right, so we see that it's rather easy or medium easy <laughs> hard to implement. So very good. I think um, that can go on the right upper hand side of our chart that we're going to show you later. And it has a high impact, medium impact. So very good, excellent. Um, Thanks so, a lot. <laughs> Uh, if you can, if you can share that and you have already, uh, so people can see how you have structured it, um, that is great. I, I shared it already. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. So with this, we have the opportunity to to go to Denmark now, which is excellent. So municipality of Aarhus, and we have uh, Peter Christensen with us, um, mm. who is going to tell us about the rolling repair van. So uh, yeah, presentation yeah. is up. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I come from Kressler, which is the heat and waste uh, management department in Aarhus in Denmark. And um, first slide, please. Uh, since 2018, we have been taking part in the two large projects. You, you can see in yes, this ye yellow box, some data about the project which is run by seven partners. Interreg project where we're dealing with reuse and uh, recycling. And we had to decide uh, what to to what kind of action plan to make, and it was e quite easy for us. When I asked my colleagues, "What is what is going on in this area?" and uh, immediately you're we talking about repair, repair cafes. It's it's a big movement here in in Denmark. In the last four years, uh, the number of municipalities dealing with repair cafes had almost doubled. And the reason why is Fred was explaining a lot about the behavior side, but it's also a matter of, of if you have something of quality, you like to keep it. And another issue is the economy right now. There's a lack of materials, a lack of spare parts. So, so it might be easier to repair the stuff instead of throwing it away. And then there's a very important common sense and a good feeling about it. We see. If you repair Hoover, uh, your, your relationship to the Hoover have changed forever. You, you feel like uh, now you know what's inside the Hoover and how it works and you're concerned if it would keep on working. And it's also very good for, for uh, uh, using repair to talk about the green, green transition. I'll come back to that later. Next, please. The whole process of making this van is uh, we like to, to uh, ma uh, make a project which is really hands on. And uh, we were inspired by this uh, in Denmark and for sure in the rest of Europe, you have these vans going around to special places uh, in the city center selling. It could be bread, it could be fish or, or meat or, or even sweets like in Holland. And uh, we we like to have a, a, a van. And the, number two, this van should be for repairing. So the, uh, on the sketch, you see two working stations and a lot of, uh, of shelves and, and storage room for all kinds of um, repairing tools. Uh, in number three on upper right, you can see the final project, which is where you see all these shelves. And working with this kind of project uh, in Denmark, we say you have to eat your own medicine because it was working on a re recycling station. You know the things are coming, but the one one issue is you never know when. So so it was, it was a bit challenging to to get all things, but uh, we got most of it. But of course, all the tools, advanced tools for, for making, um, it could be uh, iPhones and stuff, we had to, uh, to buy. And we got help from a, a local uh, repair cafe and repair cafe Denmark, the umbrella organization, making lists of what were needed. That was one part, but the other important part is the human resource part. And we have our, our own uh, number of volunteers, but um, it is crucial to run a project like this to have good volunteers. So we had a, a two string strategy, our own volunteers and working with civil society organizations. Uh, 
where they had to uh, we can deliver the van and they would come with the, the people who has to sit inside and showing people how to repair please next you one. just you just have one minute left please <laughs> yeah here you see the the final project it's like a making a small repair village where everything you can sit you can sit with a sewing machine outside uh, and and help people making their stuff next one this is the learning uh, one thing is we find out it's really important to find the right spot. And as right spot was a, a flea market where we intended to meet a lot of people and regularity is no point going out one time. You need to come a lot of time. People have to know, like, if you want to buy cheese and it's every Wednesday, if you want to repair your Hoover, it's Wednesday. And the civil organization, like I told, and the volunteers are crucial and um, and most of the if we are out on a event it is 90 percent talk and 10 percent repair in the sense it's very good for awareness buildings building you might not end up with repairing a lot but there will be many people coming and say what a great uh, initiative and uh, talk about their their own stuff and then I have a small tip for you. If you go out, don't buy and make events. Don't buy these uh, things you have to roll up. Instead, you should buy a, a soap bubble machine. It is, uh, I, we had to buy it. That was only one of the few things we bought. But uh, it will attend a lot of people. because, And we, you can actually have ecological soap for uh, in the machine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, it's uh, very popular with the children as well. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very difficult to uh, um, repair or recycle roll-ups. Um, we have a lot yeah. of experience in that. <laughs> so thank you for the soap bubble tip as well. So um, excellent uh, initiative. Uh, and I think you also um, bring home the points that uh, it needs to be accessible. You have to go to the people, mm -hmm. you have to be in the right spots where you, they can find you. And uh, and uh, you need uh, you know to help the volunteers to come and the right network. So thank you very much, Peter, for this inspiring experience as well. So I uh, could give the word to Eduardo. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter. Really another interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I noticed uh, that, yeah, this model of the river truck or mobile repair is really spreading uh, throughout Europe right now. Mm. I talked before, we have some members in Catalonia doing it. There is also a uh, repair uh, cafe mobile here in Brussels and Wallonia. And uh, I wanted to know uh, for you, why is this um, river truck model becoming uh, so widespread right now? And what are its benefits compared to traditional uh, river cafes or river centers? I think one part is, is that it's obvious it's a good idea to repair your stuff. And if you come out with this message, uh, it is, uh, it comes, uh, I deal with a lot of projects, but this one is, it's like it's run itself. When you see it, you get a, get a good feeling in your stomach. Yeah, we have to repair. And that's, that's how it mainly works. This, Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you don't get a good feeling when you just throw something in the bin. Mm. But if you have repaired it yourself, and as mm. you were saying, you know the Hoover inside out now, um, and you have done uh, achieved something with that, mm. uh, I think that's an excellent feeling. Well, thank, thank you very much, Peter. I think uh, we are going to vote on, on this one as well. So is our last vote. So I hope you're not getting tired of it. So again, same question. Do you think it's rather easy to implement? Uh, and what do you think is the impact? Is that high, medium or low impact that you can achieve with this repair truck? Unmuting helps. So um, yes, so we see this should be rather easy to implement um, and uh, it should have also a high impact. So thank you very much uh, for another inspiring 
high impact uh, initiative that you have been presenting, Peter. So my colleague Magda is now um, putting all of this on a, a overview, which she, um, when she's ready, is going to share with us. So yes, you can share it now. That would be great. So you, we can see how you how you have been voting uh, on all these different uh, initiatives. So we see that um, it was a feeling, but uh, we see it now also on this on this chart. So how you have been voting the. Um, impact uh, you see uh, of all of these initiatives is rather high. So um, between medium and high. So um, it's just more or less uh, easy to implement. So for the easy to implement, we see here, we just had the repair trucks, but also the online guide. Um, then we see that the, in the medium range is the Latido Verde. So for, for the textiles, um, the reuse centers as presented from Malta and also the reparateurs are going already into the more difficult to implement uh, 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 site, uh, and the réseau consigne is uh, seen as uh, rather uh, difficult to implement. So, um, but everything is worthwhile. Uh, we see that it may take a little bit more or less effort um, uh, to to to. To conclude a little bit on, on what we have just heard, I think um, reuse and repair are um, used to be the before they used to be the tip of, of the iceberg or let's say the tip of our waste mountain uh, in, in Europe. And uh, we all know that we have to turn this waste pyramid around and make uh, waste prevention uh, with reuse and repair the basis of our way of living circular and social and uh, and how to deal with uh, with our products uh, so that they don't even become waste. So um, we have heard here that uh, there's lots of different uh, possibilities to do so. Um, with regard to behavior change, it's not only that we have to have uh, the technical qualifications, but there's also a lot of uh, human uh, um, aspects that we have to, to cover. And uh, we've heard uh, not only from Fred, but also from others, you know, use the right time, use the right place, make it easy to access, make it uh, uh, close to you, um, use the times of the spring clean or uh, maybe uh, the Christmas time where you can give away things uh, uh, and so on. We've all heard in the during Corona or the COVID uh, pandemic, how many people have been starting to clean out their houses and uh, that would have also been a good time then what else? Co-creation and combination of uh, different measures are, are a key point that we could uh, keep in mind, bringing also the different value chains together for, for example, for the deposit systems, but also the different repair uh, companies that could participate in something like that. Um, and for the behavior change, we have also learned that there is now um, a, a larger toolbox available, not only communication, but also meaningful communication, two-way communication and other tools uh, which we can all share with you. Um, important points that have been made was that uh, the quality and the safety of the products that are repaired or to be reused uh, needs to be guaranteed and uh, we have to keep up to high standards. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that uh, uh, these products are more expensive and uh, certainly um, there's still a lot of long way to go, maybe also for Eduardo and his colleagues to um, to see what happens to the VAT that is on uh, uh, on the products and so on and so forth. So the investment in the initiatives, at least from my point of view, uh, the, there were not huge amounts and uh, uh, there was a possibility to invest in that. Lots of funds that are available uh, in terms of recovery and resilience fund, the European social fund, the ERDF, uh, just to name a few, are available uh, to put this uh, initiative into place. And then, of course, you have to have somebody who is engaging with that, like we had Peter and we had Ariane, or we had uh, um, uh, our other colleagues like Danielle uh, and Ulrike, which have been explaining uh, how they have been engaged and how they're taking care of their initiatives. So we need these people that are also investing their time and their interest uh, as well. Challenges, yes, the high cost of repair, maybe the ineffectiveness of the um, extended producer responsibility systems. Um, 
but all in all, um, more training needed uh, for everybody uh, that is participating in these schemes and also to enabling people themselves to, uh, to know how to repair things at home again, uh, which they used to do many years ago, but not, don't do it anymore. So this is it uh, from, from my side. Um, maybe we can uh, just have a short word uh, from, uh, from all of you. What is your, your main key takeaway from our speakers? Uh, so maybe we can start with, uh, with Fred, just uh, each of you uh, a very short sentence. What is your key takeaway? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, well, uh, there is a lot of uh, great work being done at different levels on both reuse and repair. So that's obviously a very exciting place to start from. And I felt a bit like a kid in a candy store in the sense that uh, there's also like so many opportunities to uh, elevate and improve uh, these programs using uh, using uh, behavior science uh, and behavior change techniques. So it's just really, really interesting as a, as a landscape of what exists uh, today. And the innovation always happens where the crossroads are meeting. So really happy to have you here, Fred, and, uh, and bring this together. Eduardo, what is your main key takeaway today? Yeah, I actually agree very much with what Fred just said. I think that the reuse panel was as interesting as the panel on repair. And I do agree, yeah, that it's great to see so many people, so many different initiatives being done at the local level, because that's really, yeah, a lot of action can be done once again there at the local level. It's where the impact and benefits of a linear or circular economy would be more felt. So, yeah, it was really great uh, yeah, to have this discussion. And thanks again to you, Astrid, to Magda and Eugenie for organizing this event. Thank you very much. Uh, giving the word to Antonio, um, what was your key takeaway today? Sorry, what was that? Sorry. One of your key takeaways, you, your, one of the lessons learned or one of an inspiring idea that you- Well, many, many, today. many lessons learned. So, uh, sorry, I think it was really uh, very, very interesting. Uh, everything is very interesting to share all this information. I really, I'm, I really like the idea of the, this repair uh, drug. I will think about it. It's, it's, it's something I think we could use, especially for rural areas. I think that we, because we were thinking about doing something in those areas, and I think it's a, an idea that in which we, we have to, to study. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe also give the word to the, Daniel. Did you take any inspiring ideas away with you today? Yes, it's, it's very interesting. Um, obviously, all the projects uh, mentioned or discussed um, are designed for the local needs, but obviously from what we've heard, it is easy uh, to modify um, for the local scenario. So yes, we're looking at, we'll see the presentation in more detail and for sure we'll, uh, we'll be in touch with the, with the other speakers if we need any other clear um, clarity. Thanks, Daniel, and uh, congratulations to the good start of your centers you. because they're very recent. So, again, well, well done. So, uh, looking at Benjamin, I'm not looking at you because I can't see you, but okay, Benjamin, did you take any ideas away with you? And maybe we lost Benjamin, Ariane. Yes, I wanted uh, to, to thank you uh, for providing us such an exchange. And um, I, I, remember, I will remember that always connecting people uh, who work in the same field, but in different conditions uh, that help to be inspiring, uh, inspired and, um, and to remind to keep eyes and ears open always. So thank you very much. Yeah, and looking at Ulrike. Hello, um, let's say, I, 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 what I saw is that that our, um, what, what we are doing all over Europe is quite similar. Let's say there are lot, many places where, where we try to work with repair guides and many places where we try to work with repair trucks and whatever, and repair cafes and, 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 and uh, reuse shops and uh, implementation of social um, issues. Uh, 
But the main thing is that wherever I look, we are depending on public funding for all for all those implementations. And I think that this is still an area where we have to improve. Let's say even I'm from the public sector, but I know we have to improve to put all those initiatives uh, in on independent pillars, let's say, and make them more economically uh, sustainable, let's say. And that this is the, the big, um, I said, let's say working area for the next years, how, how to bring that forward, I, I would say. Thank you very much. Very important point. Yeah, how to make it economically sustainable. Um, yes. How can we advance on that? Uh, so also in this area, we need to do a lot of work. So before giving the word to our uh, uh, speaker from the European Commission, uh, just the last word from you, Peter. So what was your main idea that you have been taking away? Oh, there were many things. It was an inspiring afternoon. But one thing is, uh, if you're working with this repair area, you can be some kind of lonely sometimes. And I was so pleased to see that uh, people in Barcelona are doing almost the same as we are doing. So that was something practical I will take out and uh, I have to contact them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is good that you're not, uh, uh, that you see that uh, a lot of people working on these uh, issues and that you're not alone uh, in your corner. Um, thank you very much for, for, for sharing your ideas with us. And without further ado, um, we're really happy that we have uh, Johannes Antonopoulos with us. So um, Johannes, um, please uh, let us know um, what are the new reusable packaging targets and the uh, review of the EU packaging and packaging waste directive and what we can take away from that. Hello, good afternoon. I hope uh, that you can uh, see me and hear me well. Yes, we can, but okay, we don't see good. your presentation yet. <laughs> yes, I'm just trying to trying to do it. <laughs> so it should be done in a few seconds. Can you can you see it or? We just saw it. Now it's uh, gone away again. Is it gone away? Okay. And then. So it's coming. Full screen mode, maybe. Yes, my computer. Okay. Perfect. Now we that see should, it. Should be fine. Excellent. Now. Yes, Good. it is. So many thanks uh, for the invitation and also for the opportunity to speak a little bit, a little bit about uh, the, the proposal of the Commission, which was adopted uh, last uh, November within the uh, Secure Economy Package uh, 2. Uh, it was also part of uh, another two other uh, proposals, but uh, which is the communication on uh, by biodegradable, bio bio-based and compostable waste and uh, on carbon removal, but this is a big, uh, let's say, regulative uh, uh, legal instrument, that, let's say, that contains the package. Um, uh, just to say that the status of this the, it was just adopted by the Commission and this will follow the ordinary legislative procedure in the, in the, of, of the Union, which basically now uh, is being uh, scrutinized by the Council of the European Union and the European uh, Parliament. So my name is Jens Adonopoulos. I'm working in Digital Environment Unit B3 from Waste Resources, which we deal with the secure economy aspects. I'm one of the officers in charge of uh, the development of the regulation on packaging and packaging uh, waste. Uh, without any other uh, further uh, introduction, the, the presentation, I will just try to show you a uh, few information about the impact assessment that we carried out. The impact assessment, the impact assessment study was the main background um, estimations, calculations, mass flows that we did, and of course, impact assessment, uh, environmental impact assessment, and social and economic as well, uh, in order to come uh, along uh, with all the, the measures. Uh, that the regulation comes uh, with, which of course includes uh, uh, measures on reuse. Uh, so this is another busy slide, but uh, I just uh, um, inserted only uh, to show you that one of the problems that we encountered um, during the execution of the impact assessment was that basically we have high levels um, of packaging that could be avoided by uh, measures on prevention or even by reuse. We have a tremendous increase of the single-use uh, packaging, and we have also the barriers which we see that the reuse systems uh, are not cost-efficient, 
are not very well uh, deployed in the U. We have some labeling that does not work very well. So these uh, important elements, uh, along with all the other parameters that you can find in this uh, rather busy slide, led us to the three objectives uh, to, to develop the new proposal, which is the reduce, uh, which is the reduction of the generation of packaging waste, to promote a circular economy for packaging in a cost-efficient way, and to promote the uptake of recycled content in packaging. And all these three objectives, we tried also to put them in the proposal. In this slide, you can see uh, in the fourth column, the option two. Option two means that uh, while we were building the proposal, we tried also to accommodate, of course, the three objectives that I uh, just mentioned by uh, building, uh, constructing, setting up various measures, measures that address the reuse, measures that try to improve the recyclability of packaging, uh, measures that uh, also address compostability aspects. All this we will also see in the next uh, slides. But this is just to, to to explain to you that this proposal consists of several uh, options. So the option two was in the impact assessment, uh, the, the best, let's say, uh, option that will also ensure that will be very efficient and will be very proportionate uh, when it is uh, when it will be applied, implemented in the EU. Uh, that is just I mean to know exactly what I was speaking about with this um, in this in this column. But uh, I mean the message also here to see is that. Uh, in the third column, the business as usual uh, means that without any policy intervention, uh, the packaging waste generation will raise, will increase, uh, will continue basically to increase uh, dramatically or even you know a lot with, with, with uh, a lot of uh, pace. So if the measure, if the proposal as it is now with the level of ambition that it has, it will be applied, we'll see that we will achieve a significant reduction of packaging waste. Another illustration that basically depicts also this situation is, um, uh, is the illustration of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the development, the trend that, um, uh, that uh, the, the, the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions will follow if we don't, uh, let's say, take any action. Uh, so the blue line is the trend, which is also uh, which also means is the business as usual scenario where we don't uh, assume, where we assume that any uh, policy intervention will not, play, will not uh, take place. So we, we really need a systemic change here in order to uh, divert uh, this, uh, this situation. And the two dots that you can see with the orange color uh, depict uh, the, um, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions that we will achieve if we implement the measures of this uh, proposal. Uh, another illustration now on the effects, let's say, uh, of uh, the proposals, uh, of, of the proposal, excuse me. So here you can see that we have the, the various packaging uh, uh, materials. So you can see the plastic, paper, cardboard, aluminum, steel, glass, wood, and other packaging, where the waste generation in 2018 was quite significant, but uh, we have modeled that uh, the proposal will have, uh, let's say, an effect uh, will will basically reduce the amount of packaging uh, waste, maybe except plastic, which is not so certain. And th this might be also because of the use or because also of other uh, trends, market trends, like, you know, the shift to, to other packaging, like to single use that we try also to revert. But this also needs also, it's also linked to the consumer uh, behavior. So, uh, but it's also true that the recycling rate that will be achieved will be significantly higher. So we assume that this the recycling rates will be increased by six, seven percent, whilst for land for landfill will be reduced by half or even by 100 percent. And this is quite a striking figure, I think. Now we dive into, let's say, to the main elements of the proposal. Uh, uh, this proposal now, uh, the legal instrument is a regulation. What means in practice uh, the regulation aims to replace an old directive, directive which was uh, uh, implemented in 90, which was basically adopted in 94, which is very old. Uh, it doesn't contain a lot of, um, or let's say very effective and efficient measures uh, about the, uh, the requirements of the packaging in order to be placed on the market. It was a very old uh, directive. So with the regulation, we try uh, to basically uh, to allow some efficiency gains uh, 
to the economic uh, operators, and we have also some measures and provisions that will reinforce the compliance uh, of um, of the economic operators with uh, the, the the measures in this um, in this uh, regulation. So for the, for this uh, event, I, I will also I will only focus on the first uh, element, which is on the first area, if you want, on the prevention and the reuse. Um, so it is quite also important to say that um, with this proposal, uh, it is the first time ever that the Commission uh, regulates the upper levels of the waste hierarchy, which is basically the prevention and reuse. So with this, uh, we try, we say that uh, we set some um, waste reduction targets at member state level, which is 5% by 2030. 10% by 2035 and 15 by 2040. And in order to be achieved, and in order to, to, to be achieved this, to be implemented, uh, the member states have a lot of flexibility. They can, let's say, of course, implement some waste prevention measures and or measures on reuse. These measures are also coupled with some um, obligations to the economic operators. So we also try, we also aim to enforce the compliance I also explained before. Uh, so, I mean, there's no point, I think, to read that out now all the measures, but that does, I will give an example, is to limit the void space on the e-commerce. So basically, when we uh, are about to uh, to, to have, uh, to, to set an, uh, an, um, an, um, an, an order, uh, to, to, to order something uh, via electronic platforms, then we receive usually parcels with a lot of packaging. With this uh, new requirement, will have some, uh, um, uh, we will we'll try to reduce all this uh, uh, unnecessary package by 40% in the sense that basically we, there are some limits on the void uh, space of the packaging. And this is one measure, one measure that can be uh, implemented and also uh, help uh, achieving, all the, help delivering um, uh, the waste reduction uh, targets. And now this is the slide in order to see how these uh, targets, these reduce targets, are really uh, going to be implemented in practice and, in fact, what will change uh, in our daily life. So here, there is no point for me, I think, to read out the entire slide as well, but this is quite important just to give in a, uh, an explanation and also to, to explain to you how we uh, selected the targets and the packaging groups. So we carried out an extensive scoping exercise and uh, we shortlisted the three sectors that you can see at the left column of the slide, the food and beverage uh, horeca sector, the food and beverage retail, and commercial and industrial. And we have 10 uh, packaging uh, products, uh, groups and uh, products. Uh, this, um, uh, this coping exercise took into account a number of criteria, like excessive uh, use of uh, single-use packaging, the necessity of packaging, recyclability and recycling content of, package, uh, of packaging, uh, some product specific characteristics, uh, type of reuse and the uptake potential. And of course, uh, with all of the assessment uh, that, uh, that we carried out, uh, we felt that um, we realized that these uh, targets will really ensure a critical mass for the concerned uh, operators. Uh, we assessed uh, various levels of targets uh, low ambition targets or low level targets or and high level targets and uh, we concluded that this uh, level of targets that we arrived uh, ensures a, a, a coexistence a really healthy if i can say efficient uh, coexistence of reuse and recycling uh, systems and uh, to derive to to arrive to all this um, uh, targets to this, let's say, number of targets, like 10% or 3 or 5%, etc. We really quantified the mass flows of packaging, including some uh, switches uh, from uh, single use to multiple to multiple use uh, uh, packaging to meet uh, the targets. And of course, we quantify all the environmental impacts because of these uh, different mass flows in order to see also what is uh, what are really the impacts to the environment, but also to the society and to, uh, to the economy. Uh, just I mean to mention that uh, if you see, while well, you see and read out this um, slide, you will see that at the end of its uh, packaging group and product, you will see also uh, to which um, economic operator this uh, uh, this target refers to. For, for instance, in the first uh, row, you can see that this target 
uh, addresses all the refillers. So basically all the ones who refill the packaging with beverages, for instance, and the final distributor, who is the last actor who sells basically these uh, beverages, either cold or hot. Johannes, please conclude. Yes, this is the last slide, apparently. <laughs> and this is just to, 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 to tell you that uh, in the proposal, we don't come up with uh, specific, with only these uh, targets, but we try to set up a really a comprehensive framework. So it's about to create a mindset about uh, the reuse. So we come up in the annexes and the various articles and recitals of these regulations with definitions on reuse, single use packaging, rotations, meaning how many times can be uh, reused and used uh, this, uh, this packaging. Uh, what are the systems of reuse? Because this also uh, is not very clear. This is what uh, we also understood during, uh, the, inter during the, uh, the implementation, the execution of the impact assessment. What are the conditions of, recon of reconditioning, refill and refill stations? And all the other, uh, let's say, we also try to standardize the reusable packaging and so on. This will basically create a lot of uh, legal certainty into the economic operators in order to try to implement uh, the reuse um, in an efficient uh, way. That was uh, all from my side. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And of course, I remain available to answer any question uh, you may have now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing this work with us. I think uh, you've done uh, very important steps here um, with uh, uh, providing the framework that's necessary, also with the impact assessment that you have been carrying out, by the way. Is that impact assessment available? And does it also contain um, potential figures on uh, the reduction of cost for packaging? You know, if you're reducing the volume and so on, uh, is, there, is there anything uh, contained in your impact assessment on that? Yes, indeed. The, the impact assessment uh, it is available uh, in the um, in the in the website of the commission of yeah the commission. I can also perhaps share the link exactly in the chat once uh, the event is uh, I mean, after my presentation. That would be great. Uh, the impact assessment it good. <laughs> the uh, impact assessment it is attached to the legal proposal and to the annexes. And I may also say um, there is an open consultation of this uh, proposal, which is part also of this uh, uh, ordinary legal procedure, where you can also give us uh, feedback about the, um, the, 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 the proposal. Because so far, I mean, the proposal will be considered in the Council and the European Parliament. Uh, and indeed, there are figures about the economic uh, information that uh, you asked the uh, Astrid. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That would be great if you could share that. Um, we also have a question here from Massimiliano Di Mattia. May a EU level regulation hinder member states' specific need when it comes to choose between reuse and recycling? Yes. Uh, no, no, no. I think, I mean, the main idea behind all this. Um, with this regulation, first of all, to try to address the real, uh, the, 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 the real, um, the, the real problem, which is the increase of the single-use packaging. So this is the one objective, and the second objective is to try to increase the recyclability of packaging. Because so far we have seen that indeed the recycling sector is something is a sector that is very well uh, advanced and uh, delivers. And it's quite efficient in the EU, but at the same time there is a large amount. A significant amount of packaging that is uh, non recyclable. So, uh, here we try also to create all this mindset, mindset in the EU and to try to create all these conditions in order for the reuse and recycling system to really coexist, if I can say, uh, being efficient and without hindering any, without creating any, uh, let's say, impact to the, to the society. To the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much also for your presentation. I think uh, um, there is a great work on the way to um, also help with the whole, ex, uh, you know, rever reversing, reversing of the waste pyramid uh, in terms of prevention uh, of waste uh, and, and uh, the packaging waste we have seen uh, from your slides, how much this is uh, uh, going up. The trend is, is almost unstoppable. So it's really, really important that these things are implemented.
it's also really important that we all each day take the uh, refillable bottle with us, Fred, uh, and that we're always trying to do this. Um, and we also all make our contribution. Um, so we, we have come to the end of our workshop. Uh, I kindly ask you to fill in uh, the, the feedback survey so that we know if we can uh, do anything better uh, in our events uh, and uh, how we can work on that. Um, and um, we would like to thank uh, all the speakers today uh, for all your contributions, for your questions, for the many interesting links that you have been sharing. So uh, excellent chat. Um, to tell you again, we will have recorded this event and you can watch it again. Uh, we will uh, share the presentations and um, and a little uh, article so where you can find all the information related uh, to what has been uh, discussed today. So thank you very much uh, to the speakers. Thank you very much to the team, uh, to the co-moderator, to Magda and uh, to Eugenie. Um, so I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed this event and took away a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, uh, and um, if you need any input uh, in your local systems, your regional systems, you see that we have a lot of experts in the Interreg Europe community, uh, which can share also, and we're happy to share their, their experiences. So um, we have services uh, such as peer reviews and matchmakings um, uh, where you can come and say, okay, I want to implement that system in my region. What do I have to do? And we could uh, help you with the experts to bring them to you. So thank you for attending today. Thank you for all the interesting presentations.